Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today we're starting a new segment called In Depth, and it's because when I do the news every week, it's a quick sur summary, and I don't usually get too much into what a project is about, but I hear a lot of people in the community that need a bit more information. So today we're gonna be starting off this series with a new project that's being announced on the Kickstarter uh, on my news, and it's called uh, Reveni uh, Labs, and it's a light meter. And we have Matt here from Canada Live, and we're gonna be asking him the good questions, the bad questions, we're gonna be comparing it to other things in the market, and he's gonna defend his product for you guys to watch and decide if you think it's something you are willing to support or you're something you're willing to be more interested in, follow, whatever it is. So Matt, thanks for joining me, all the way from Canada. Um, so, okay, Matt, um, tell us a bit about the project, what it is uh, right now. So it's, uh, it's a light meter that mounts onto your hot shoe and it's really, really tiny. Uh, and the idea is to uh, replace a light meter uh, or replace a light meter that's gone bad, for example, in an older camera where the selenium meter has gone bad or um, maybe in an SLR where the battery went bad and it damaged the internals so badly that the meter doesn't work anymore or um, you know, the, the really early cameras that uh, they didn't include a meter uh, or like, you know, like an M3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, you know, some of the um, sort of like pro grade cameras, for example, or cameras where um, there's metered prisms available, but um, you don't have one or they're prohibitively expensive or some of those can be um, unreliable as well. So the idea is it's to get as close to back to the internal uh, you know, built-in metering as you can get um, without actually having um, built-in internal metering. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is I'm, I'm a user of a lot of small cameras that don't have light meters. Like a Leica M2 has been my, you know, daily camera for years. And um, I've always carried a Siconic 308. And I remember on your Kickstarter video, it's like it's big and bulky. I always put it in the back of my pocket and walk out and it usually doesn't bother but I understand the concept. I also own the Voigtlander VC2 meter, which is, I think, the closest thing to what you're uh, delivering with your Kickstarter. Uh, what would be uh, the differences? I know what the differences could be to me, but I wanna know what do you think is different from your light meter to, for example, the Voigtlander? One example with the Voigtlander is uh, it's a balance meter. So you have to keep adjusting the dials until the um, green LED lights up. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I have a Voigtlander Bessa R, and I think it's, it has the functionally identical meter uh, built into it. Yeah. And um, it can be a little bit, bit of a pain having to adjust the, the, the dials until you actually get the LED to, to sort of, mm -hmm. you know, come off the, the limit uh, and start to move towards the center. Um, and, I mean, the, the Voigtlander, I mean, it's a really nice meter, but it is still also quite large. Like, um, you know, when you see it on a camera... It looks at home, you know, on a Leica, but um, it is still pretty big. And I thought, I thought to myself, um, you know, I could build a little meter. And then I said, well, what if it was, uh, what if it was the same size as the accessory shoe? Yeah, so basically, it's like the size of the of the light meter. I mean, of the hot shoe going up. Like I remember on the Kickstarter campaign, you can see the pentaprism of I think probably like a K1000 or similar. And it basically looks like the pyramid has a little cherry on the top. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The goal was to get it as close to fitting uh, inside that um, footprint as I could. Now, it, it's a little bit larger. Like if you if you had, you know, a hot shoe at the bottom of a hole, it wouldn't fit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's 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 quite it's close. close to being. Yeah, I can see it's flush, um, which is nice. Yeah. Um, actually, that's something that people have raised uh, and is a good point. So this this is an earlier prototype. Um, and if you can see there, it does kind of protrude out the back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I have made an adjustment where um, so this this unit is not adjusted, but the the new design um, for my pre-production, uh, the uh, the front portion of where it enters the shoe uh, has been reduced. So it will move a little further into the cameras um, because people were concerned um, basically that the, the meter was protruding uh, off the back of some cameras because most, most shoes have a little stopper at the front. Mm -hmm. um, so I've made an adjustment now where it can slide 
um, a little bit beyond if that's required so that it doesn't hang off the back of the of the shoe at all or off the back of the camera at all. Okay. Um, so that was a point that some people had raised um, uh, through the, you know, through messages um, after I had made the design public. Uh, and, and so that's an adjustment that I've made in the design. Okay. And one, uh, just to be sure that we mention it, it's a reflective light meter. So it's reading reflected light. It doesn't have a anything in front of it. It's basically the, I guess, light sensitive sensor, whatever it could be there. And you adjust the angle with the 3d construction. So the angle of view, which is also sort of important is defined by the 3d in ca like a capsule or the shell. Yeah, it's it's shrouded by the by the housing. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a bare sensor behind there. There's no diffuser. Mm -hmm. There's no diffuser. There's no optics, but there is the shroud of the uh, enclosure around it. And there is a small. Um, it's probably hard to see. I'm sure me holding it up to the camera is no, not I'll the best way the to do it. Pictures on it. There's a small. There's a small um, sunshade essentially. There's a there's a lip over the top of the sensor so that, um, you know, the bright sky does not overly influence the, the reading. Mm -hmm. And um, the sensor is kind of naturally um, um, center weighted. So the angle of the light that strikes the sensor, uh, you could have the same intensity of light. And if it's hitting it at a 45 degree angle, it registers lower than if it's hitting at a 90 degree angle. So some of the light is uh, bounced off the front of the sensor um, and is and is scattered and doesn't actually strike the like the, the, the photo, you know, the pixel essentially mm -hmm. of the sensor. Um, so it's sort of naturally center weighted that if you aim it straight at a, at a bright light source or you aim it off angle to a bright light source, um, the, the reading intensity will change. So mm -hmm. it's sort of naturally center weighted in a way. It's not okay. center weighted by multimetering, but it's center weighted by the nature to which the sensor interacts with light. Yeah, basically, and the, the, the little sunshade also can probably helps a little bit for the angle, I guess. Yeah, that helps cut off um, really extraneous light. So if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you had the sun um, in front of you, but but high overhead, um, you know, it's essentially like a lens hood, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's essentially a built in lens hood. Okay, okay. And so far, your goal for the Kickstarter, uh, let me remind me what it was, I think 17, because I see it in euros and you're in dollars, and you're actually in Canadian dollars. So I don't know exactly. That's right. Yeah. What was the goal? Uh, so, so the target was 16,000 Canadian, uh, mm -hmm. which is about 12,000 US. Um, that would cover that would have been about 140 units, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, that was the kind of quantities I was aiming for about a hundred units in order to make sure that the, um, um, the manufacturers of the circuit board and the, the circuit board assembler, because I, I won't be able to, um, build all the circuit boards by hand myself. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a local company local to me here in Ontario, uh, just outside of Toronto, um, who's going to be assembling the circuit boards for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, one of the nice things about the success, I was concerned that the uh, quantities were going to be too low, that I wouldn't be able to do it uh, in Canada. I'd have to have assembly done um, overseas, mm -hmm. uh, just like PCB assembly, sorry. And then, yeah. I, and then the assembled PCBs would be brought to me. I would have to do some uh, extra pieces part like this, the way the sensor mounts is kind of special. So I, I'd have to, I want to do, I would do that myself to make sure it was right. And then... Um, do the final assembly, like putting it in the enclosure and everything, and then calibrating and programming and packaging and shipping. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I was, um, I, you know, you know, when you're dealing with overseas, you know, there's a 12 hour time change and all that stuff. So it's really difficult to resolve problems mm -hmm. uh, if they arise. And so um, because of the numbers, actually, I was able to go back to a local uh, assembler and get a competitive quote. Um, so it, it became feasible luckily because of the, the, um, the, 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 yeah, the surprising sort of over response. Yeah. One of the things I've been surprised and don't get me wrong, I'm a very positive person in terms of new products in the film world. And as I told you through messaging while we, um, you know, coming to this meeting is that we need more makers is the fact that you got a lot of response from a lot of people before anyone had really tested it. Like when I had the negative supply, which is what another Kickstarter that's been actually still going on, um, and the response was very positive, I had already tested a prototype. 
So when I made a video and I supported it, it was like with actual know-how, like, okay, I've seen this thing because I saw it and of course it's on the expensive side of scanning. And I was like, well, this is just, and when I got it in my hands and I tested it and it was a prototype, I was blown out and actually I reached out to them and I was like, I really want one, you know? And we came out with an agreement for a sponsorship for the channel and you know, it all came like that. But I was very surprised. But when I saw yours pop, because you came out of nowhere in my point of view, and I usually am pretty aware of news and stuff, but I had never seen anything developed by you or the uh, Reveni Labs. I think I actually saw maybe a 3D camera device, maybe, because I followed you on Instagram. But when I saw you pop and everyone, Hamish Gill, Camera Rescue, and a lot of people came to say like, hey, this is awesome. I was like, why is everyone praising something that nobody's really seen, you know? And I, and my, my inner critic was like, why would I support if I don't know anything about it? So this is when I wanted to talk to you. So what is the background and what would you tell people in the sense like, will you deliver? We all know that Kickstarters are a very risky move because of course there's been a lot of big ones that have failed. Um, one way or another. And I, I have my own Kickstarter that I'm still trying to finish because I do too many things. Um, so what would you tell people to, you know, trust Matt? And I know it's not a lot of money, but still, I mean, it's a little bit of money. What would you say in terms of delivering? Are you made other things before? Is there any other projects we can go to and see before? Well, so I, I've been, I, I mean, I've been a maker of for as long as I can remember. Um, and my, you know, my, I think my skills have finally grown to the point. I mean, I'm, I'm 29 years old now. Um, I've been working for the better part of a decade. Um, I, I work for a company where I do product design and I do a lot of varied work. Um, mm -hmm. it's a small company, so I do a lot of varied work on the product design, um, portion of my job. Um, I, um, I've been working on this project in one way or another um, for for quite a number of years, um, and it's sort of evolved over time, um, getting closer and closer to uh, what I thought was was a viable product. And the technology, um, you know, miniaturization and modernization, um, and the advent of things like the, the the tiny screen is a is an OLED screen, um, and uh, things like Fitbits have really driven the cost of those down and made it more, uh, accessible. Um, so like part of, part of what makes this product possible is the sort of the confluence of technologies, um, that's, um, made it, uh, like a, a viable product, like that, the, that the parts are available and you don't need, you know, custom sensors necessarily and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also, um, advances in, th in 3d printing technology. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people have brought up about this product is, my my intention is actually to not have um, injection mold tooling made to produce the enclosure. I want the final product to be made from um, what's called multi-jet fusion 3D printing. Mm -hmm. um, so 3D printing kind of gets a bit of a bad rap as being, you know, this like home hobby um, kind of excuse for a bad looking product. Mm -hmm. um, multi-jet fusion technology uses um, powdered nylon and... Um, essentially a, a like a, an inkjet printer head that shoots a um, plastic binder uh, onto the nylon to fuse it together and it's it's extremely high resolution um, the prints have um, no um, uh, dimensional weaknesses so the way that normal 3d prints um, they have a weak d uh, dimension the z yeah. the z dimension is weak um, this stuff is um, is isotropic it's it's the same strength in all three dimensions um, and the printing has very few limits on orientation of parts and shapes of geometries. You don't have to support anything. Um, so you can, you can make any, you can make parts and use the design, uh, or the capabilities of the printing technology to make parts that are actually impossible to injection mold. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, I've tried to leverage that technology to make this product, um, as, uh, complex as possible or complex in in that it's um, like feature packed um, without uh, having to um, make an investment in injection molding and and the caveats that come with that like minimum minimum quantities of pen, you know the, the dead of the mold but then minimum order quantities because um, you know people say oh but then every parts only a you know 
50 yeah. cents or whatever but yeah but you have to put 10 20 30 grand for the mold and then you have to you know adjust it for the smallest amounts and not only that but if you want you know let's say you have the mold you want 10 more parts um the molding company is going to charge you to, to put the mold in the injection machine and run it right like you can't order 10 parts after that you still have to order a thousand parts at a time because they're they're setup fees there's there's costs they're shipping yeah they're gonna they're gonna bill you it's not you know it's not 50 cents it's yeah, 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 un yeah. unless you're getting unless you get a crate of them it's not 50 cents each right um the other concern and i'm sure many a kickstarter has failed because of this is if there's a problem with the injection mold tooling that might be the death of the the project right there. Yeah, no, no, I know the cost of, I mean, in, like the molds. I've seen Pixelator with Hamish Gill and how he's been moving it half a millimeter or a tenth of a millimeter, and it's probably dug into his own pocket because yeah, there's a bunch of cash, but that diminishes a very fast pace with with injection. Yeah, mold modifications are so incredibly expensive, and if there's a problem where um, they can't rework the mold that's already been made and you start from scratch, mm -hmm. that's that, that could be fatal, right? Like yeah. if it's $20,000 or something. So um, another thing that I've seen since you launched the Kickstarter um, is that a lot of people have requested little things and you've listened to a lot of the people like the pinhole apertures or, you know, um, you know, the enclosures, the, all these things you've addressed, which I highly recommend that people are wanting to go, go to the Kickstarter and check the questions and stuff because there's a conversation going on. And uh, sadly, Kickstarter won't let you ask things without being a pledger, but you can always give a dollar, leave your comment, and always change it to more or less. Um, but like, um, I was gonna say, have you changed the product a lot since you launched it and gotten the response and thought, oh, these things could be implemented easily or not? Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to say, if someone does wanna contact me, um, they can, there's a contact us page on my website um, Raveni dash labs.com. You can go on there and contact me directly. You don't have to do it through Kickstarter or you can okay. uh, message me on Instagram. So I have been getting a lot of messages through those other, uh, avenues as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, so actually it, it's another, um, point about the, about the printing. Um, people were asking for, um, oh, you know, I, I have a viewfinder. Uh, so I need my, I need my shoe. I can't give it to the light meter. Um, some people um, wanted, uh, you know, like um, a necklace mount or so I so I came up with uh, so far I have five different accessories that I've um, announced. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a wrist strap. There's a finger ring. Uh, essentially, they're all just different shoe mounts. Yeah. The, <laughs> the finger ring one started as a joke, but um, it's actually kind of it's kind of neat because um, you can you can hold it um, with uh, like you could have your camera in one hand and, and, and you could put it on your other finger and you can operate it with one hand. Um, if you strap it to your thumb, yeah. um, and then there's the wristwatch strap. Um, so, um, you know, if you, if you, if you're somebody like, I mean, I used to use a Sekonic Deluxe a lot, Studio Deluxe, and, uh, I used to try to carry it around my neck on a, on a, mm -hmm. uh, a thing so I couldn't drop it and, uh, it would get all tangled up in the, in the camera strap. Um, and if I was wearing a, a camera bag too, like I was just, I had so many things around my neck that. They were just kind of balling up on me, um, but I don't want to drop it, of course. So you know, I, I figured that was um, you know safer than keeping it in my pocket and eventually dropping it. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're wearing jeans or something, it's difficult to put you know much of anything in a, in a, in your pants. I live I um, live with my Sekonic in the back pocket. And I remove this the strap and I just pull it out when I need it and pull it back in. And so far, I never dropped it. But the Sekonic three hundred eight like is one of those light meters that you can drop like probably 20 times and it won't break <laughs> and yours i'm sure it can be dropped because at the end of the day that it's so lightweight i think you say it's like eight grams or something like that that that's right yeah it weighs only uh eight grams with so like it, it'll almost stop itself from the wind friction you know and it's going to be dropped or something like that yeah if you if you dropped it hard enough i think the only thing you that the battery um door would probably come off and the battery would fall out but it won't it won't it won't it, it'll be like you'd have those, to try very hard those old nokias that would just explode and then you put them back together and they would keep on working not like modern day phones um that's right so, yeah. yeah so that's good that we can address i mean the kickstarter is still going on i know it's already been successful and probably 200 times whatever you were reach uh you know your goal was and by the time this video is uploaded it might be 300 or more 
Well, um, right now it's it's five hundred and sixty percent. Oh wow, that's good. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people had seen is there were other things similar. And I hadn't even noticed there was a light meter that looks very much in inspired either way, because I, of course, the light meter it has so much you can put into it. And it was on eBay. It's made somewhere in China, probably. Uh, you hadn't seen this before your campaign at all. That's right. I never noticed that one. Um, I. Uh, I actually had a hard time finding it the first time. Somebody had mentioned it. Um, I met a I met a guy and he said, "Oh, I showed this. I showed your your product to a friend of mine, and he said that in in China on Taobao, which is their uh, I guess their Chinese eBay, he said that it's it's available on there. And then I did eventually find a link um, to uh, US eBay where uh, someone is selling um, like it, it's similar." So I don't know a lot about it. They don't. They don't. Um, they don't have a ton of pictures um, that show super close up. But apparently, um, it uses the same um, kind of screen. It uses quite a bit larger screen, but it uses the same um, OLED display. Um, it has a shoe mount on the bottom, um, and it is uh, rechargeable rather than using uh, LR44 uh, coin cell. Mm -hmm. um, so. The rechargeability thing is just a sort of a, um, a matter of approach. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, your battery couldn't die in the field on you and you could, you know, you can you can tuck an LR44 in your pocket. You might already have one anyway if you've got yeah. another camera with a meter. Yeah, I've, 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 I've had to open the four LR44 because that's what the Pentax 6.7 will use. And I've before had to like break it open and pull out those individual ones for like a little late meter and stuff like that. No, yeah. I, I remember seeing that. I haven't seen either yours or the, the eBay one. And I was like, oh, that really looks very similar. Yours is much smaller. And to go over the settings that it does, I think I saw on the video, it has aperture priority mode. And you yep. have shutter priority mode and you can change the ISO. One thing that I haven't mentioned that happens to me on the Voidlander version is that the kick, the ISO is a little physical wheel that can be knocked very easily out of adjustment. So if you have it at 1600 ISO and you walk around with it on your neck, you know, you have it on your camera, you're moving around and it, it's pretty well tight on the camera. But if you knock it by accident, you might be metering at 400 ISO, but yours is with the little buttons and all that, like, it's inside a menu. So what are the options? You can change the ISO, aperture priority, or shutter priority. Those are the three things, basically. Actually, um, through some suggestions, I've added some more features now. Um, there's some, some people were, were asking for it. Well, so there were some pinhole users who were asking for higher, IS, uh, higher uh, apertures. So uh, I extended the aperture range um, from my original F128. I extended it up to F1024. Mm -hmm. um, that I mean, that's it's like I, somebody asked for F two fifty, so I extended it, and then somebody asked for F three fifty, so I just went to F one thousand twenty four yeah, and just said, go all the way. nobody can. I don't think anybody can want more than that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the and then the um, shutter speeds can go as high as eight minutes. So it's okay. got um, it's got length on both ends there. So um, it should be um, it should work reasonably well for pinhole users. Mm -hmm. um, I should say it's not a meter that's um, it's not specifically optimized for uh, ultra low light. Uh, I've had some people say, you know, can I meter at night with this? Um, I think you will run into some trouble with extremely low light. Um, it's just very difficult to accurately measure incredibly low light. You know, I mean, it makes sense. I, to be honest, and this is a world that I think is new to a lot of people. Night photography most of the time shouldn't really be metered. Like if you're shooting night enough times, you already know. And also people forget that from 30 minutes to an hour, if you're late, you're just, yeah, it's one <laughs> stop. And people are like, no, it's like, yes, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, I think it's more due to the comprehension of people who are shooting night today. Maybe you're newbies to film and as you can't have that immediacy of like, oh yeah, my screen shows dark, I'm shooting wrong. And then you can always meter something with a higher EV and then just do the multiplication. Like if you get a metering of eight minutes, but you want to stop it down two more uh, stops, you just, you know, 16 and another one is 32. And you're like, there you right. go. So I think, I mean, I understand your light meter. First, the price point is very reasonable uh, for a device this small and a Kickstarter. And, you know, you're not a massive production. 
but like people forget that you can really just meter and then do your own math. Like it's not that hard. And, They're overthinking and I, it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody wants the perfect device for $20, but there's a limit to everything. Um, another feature I added was uh, exposure compensation. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go uh, up or down two stops in one third stop increments. Um, mm -hmm. So that's accessible through the menu as well. And yeah, no, I think, I mean, I see your product as what you say it on your Kickstarter. You have an old camera, you don't have a light meter, you just kind of put it on and you have the extra security of having a light meter. And the, and the, and the, and the closest thing you can get to that built in meter convenience too. That's, yeah. um, like it's a big, it's the part of the product is a big convenience thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've seen some people who say, you know, well, why would I use this? Um, it's not, or some, some people complained, uh, that I'd used a K1000 in my, in some of my photos. Mm -hmm. Um, and they said, well, K1000 has a, has a meter built in and it's a good meter. It's like, well, yeah, okay. But it's, you know, maybe it's broken or maybe that was a bad choice of camera. <laughs> it's, no, it's, mean, uh, it's not a meter for every camera or every person, right? It's no, a meter no. for. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do work with camera rescue and camera store in Finland. And one of the things that we're seeing and they're mentioned, and I had a conversation with you, is like a lot of the meters that people are using they don't realize they're off one stop this way or one stop that way. And if you get the one stop over, if you're shooting color negative, you're not going to really mind because your shots are still going to look beautiful. But if you are shooting this new Ektachrome 100, you kind of want to be as spot on as you can. Uh, and something like your light meter would be good. Sunny 16 works really well, but not all the time. Sunny 16 is perfect. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to guess. Our Sunny 16 is easy when it's broad daylight, but you know, shadow, shadows vary and time of day the shadow intensity varies so um guessing in the shadows is tough um like i used to joke with my friend about you know sunny 16 and then i'd say oh but do you know about you know um um uh, foggy 11 and like i just had all these like made up ones rainy eight and things like that uh -huh. <laughs> and, um but it's it's not so uh it's not so clear cut when you're once you're out of the sunlight um and um especially for people who are new to film they don't they don't want to be forced to guess um it's hard it's it's really really hard to build that exposure intuition if you're shooting blind and then you have to go and you get your prints back and you have to try to figure out what you did wrong when you were estimating and and try to work on that intuition that if you have a meter you can build your intuition a lot faster because you're getting that you're getting the immediate feedback via the meter rather than like that would be a great practice thing is just to go out and say, OK, maybe maybe it's, you know, one twenty fifth at five point six and then see what the meter says. Right. And yeah. and then you're getting that immediate feedback rather than using your camera to get the feedback, you know, uh, a week later once you get your your uh, negatives back. So, no, yeah, that's that's a good test for everyone. I mean, I think we all end up going out without a meter and pulling it out and being like, I'm sure this is this much. And you test it out and then you make sure that's that's something I think should be done as an exercise as much as possible yeah. but yeah Absolutely. um so to round it up matt um your light meter will be it's on kickstarter now when is the goal due and when are you thinking of delivering i know of course if you're selling 500 more ver uh, units than you wanted it'll be a longer run but what's the dates approximately um so uh i want i'm doing i've already actually started the the pre-production work um, because I know it's it's going to be a success now. Um, Kickstarter, there's a there's a delay between when the Kickstarter ends and you get your funds. So if you do actually need the funds to to start doing major purchasing, you do have to wait. But I've started uh, pre-production. Um, I want to um, have my local assembler test the um, their design uh, for the PCB. Or sorry, test. Um, test the assembly for the PCB to make sure that um, they don't have any trouble with um, some of the a little bit of special stuff I'm doing. Um, just because it's so small, I've got components on both sides and I've got some a little bit weird stuff going on. Um, so um, I'm doing a bunch of sort of pre-production testing stuff. I've ordered um, uh, 3D prints of the um, accessories, one, uh, some two of each of the accessory. Um, so I can do some testing on them, see how the finish is, do some tweaks if I need to, because at this point I haven't seen them yet uh, in person. That's another nice thing, by the way, is that all those accessories, I would have had had molds made for each accessory as well, right? So if I went the injection molding route, 
uh, I wouldn't. I basically wouldn't be able to offer those accessories. They just simply wouldn't exist because yeah. we'd be looking at another forty grand in molds <laughs> for yeah, the yeah. different accessory per, options per part, basically. Like Which, maybe all together or something. Yeah, it might, yeah, it might because be. Each, because each part, if there was two pieces, you need two molds. So at the end of the day, it would be so much more. Yeah. So, so um, you know, like we can thank 3D printing that those even exist, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, okay. And then, and then um, the, the, the backers will get surveyed. Uh, at the end of the, the they'll, they'll select which accessories they want. So it's, there's different um, levels they can pledge. They can pledge meter plus one, meter plus two, meter plus three. Uh, and then through the backer survey, they'll tell me which ones they want and then I'll order the quantities I need and, and I get everything exactly, you know, basically the exact number I want. So if, if there's 200 wristbands, but only 20, um, you know, hot shoe, rings. um, rings. Yeah. If there's, if only 10 rings get ordered, I can still get 10 rings made. So okay. otherwise I'd have to say, sorry guys, I can't afford the mold for 10 rings. <laughs> yeah. 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 So when's approximately like your delivery? So the pre-production um, is going to take a couple of months, um, and then um, that's going to be uh, sent out to people um, to get some, um, you know, real quality feedback from, like, you know, real like high volume shooters, someone who can really, you know, put it through some better paces than uh, than just me alone can. Uh, and then any feedback that comes back. Probably implementations will be pretty easy again because um, I can make little tweaks to the design and get new prototypes of the 3D printed parts in a couple of days. Then um, the mass production will begin. Um, all the all the assemblies being done local and the, the printing is done local as well. The printing is done in Canada um, through a through a, a printing service. That's um, they have offices sort of distributed throughout the country um, and. Then assembly and shipping actually will be the this, the the biggest bottleneck because right now it's just me. Mm. Um, so it, actually, I've been thinking if it exceeds a thousand, that I'll have to hire. I might have to hire a part time uh, assistant to help with the uh, yeah. production. Um, and it, and it may hit that. I'm not sure yet. I'm I'm at I'm at about 650 backers, but about 60 of those have ordered um, two. And four of them have ordered four, I think, at the moment. So I'm looking at over 750 units right now. Yeah. So there's still three more weeks to go. It's possible that it will exceed 1,000. Um, so I think I'll have to um, expand. I, I don't think I don't know if I can do that as a as a uh, an army of one. And yeah. uh, uh, in order to get them out in time, mm -hmm. uh, or I'll, I'll spend uh, every day for a month down in the basement working on them. Yeah. And so tell me. yeah. Um, so I've, I've said September for the final shipping, mm -hmm. but I think that's conservative. Um, I, that's, that's with, you know, extra time for some hiccups built in, uh, and especially with, you know, c the coronavirus problems going around right now. Um, I don't know necessarily what, what kind of, um, delays could be imposed on me by my suppliers. Um, for the most part, they seem okay, and I'm not too heavily reliant on overseas. Um, the um, circuit board manufacturer that I, I do have the circuit boards manufactured in China right now, um, and the uh, they actually already went through sort of the shutdown and, and restart due to coronavirus. So um, um, I, I think I'm okay on that front. And Currently, you know, around here, there's not a lot of, um, there hasn't been any coronavirus outbreaks, but in a couple of months, you know, maybe we'll be past it by then. So that, that's a big risk. That's a risk that exists for everybody everywhere. Oh, yeah. So, um, that's, uh, that's something to be seen, you know, how that unfolds. It's, it's, it's basically unprecedented in our, in our lifetimes, I think. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's a major risk. Um, but. That's a major risk to everybody, so it's kind of, you know, it's a it's a net a net zero uh, risk. I think mm -hmm. everyone's gonna be on that, have yeah, that problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, um, anything else you would add that you have I haven't asked you, or you wanted to clear off if someone's in doubt or has questions? Um, I mean, I like to encourage people to ask me. Uh, I know uh, there are people who've, you know, come to me with, with questions and criticisms and I figure for everyone who asked me, there's a hundred who didn't bother to ask. Yeah. Um, 
I've been trying to address things uh, in my project updates. I make all the project updates on Kickstarter uh, unless they're really specific. I make them um, open to everybody. You don't have to be a backer to observe the updates. Um, and if you want to contact me, um, please do. I, I'll answer any question you want. I think I can defend any question you might have. And if, if you have um, critiques or criticisms, um, and I want to make a better product. If you have a good suggestion, I mean, the, 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 the suggestions I've got in the last couple of weeks, um, have made the product better. Like that's a fact. Um, so if you have productive critiques, I want to hear them so that I can implement them. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I, I mean, that's a good way to approach it. I think in today's, you know, society of seeing things coming out all the time and, communicating with everybody which is really nice that you can reach out to anyone across the world you don't have to talk to your local store that will then tell the local this and then you know how it used to be so you yeah. can go right to the source yeah yeah exactly so yeah matt thanks for your time and anyone that wants to back it or see it all the links that matt's talked about his website his personal instagram or the reveni labs instagram will be linked below um i'm looking forward to seeing it in person at the photography show in birmingham uh, I do know it's a prototype, so of course we'll take it with a pinch of salt because it will be the finished product. Like product, but yeah, guys, if you have any questions and uh, anything like that, you can leave a comment below or to uh, Matt directly. Thanks for watching, and I hope you like this new series of in-depth, uh, you know, news in a way uh, for other videos. And yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.